And we live with all this disappointment that then makes us guarded because listen, you will never give your heart to someone you don't trust. Like think about this. I love it. Oh, that's so good. How's everybody doing? Good to see you guys. Hey, we, uh, we're in a series right now going through the Gospel of Mark, but just for like 10 seconds to zoom out, we've been really focusing on a three-year focus on what does it mean to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, and I know that might not be a word that you use every day, like most of you don't roll around and say, hey dude, what's up, like who are you a disciple of, or hey gal, or whatever, and who, who are you a disciple, we don't use that language a lot, but it means that who are you patterning your life after, who's shaping you, who's forming you, everybody here, every single one of us is being shaped and formed by something. Another way I could say it is, what's the greatest source of influence that's shaping your life? And so we would say it here, that you're either being discipled, shaped, and formed by Jesus, or you're being discipled, shaped, and formed by culture. And, and Jesus even said, like, you're either with me or you're against me. Sometimes we like to create that middle space, but we've been talking about what does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. So in the summer, what we're doing right now, we thought, how cool would it be to take a time of just a few months, the summer schedule, and just look at the life of Jesus. And you get in the, what they call the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which tell the story of Jesus. So we are just looking at the life of Jesus as told through the lens of Mark. This is where we're gonna pick up. And so I wanna invite, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 12, because here's, here's the, the context. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, the great commandment? Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, maybe some of you are like, like some of us that have been around in church for a while, like, oh yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that. A lot of us are like, great command, what? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And you're gonna see here in a moment that this is when Jesus is like, hey, hey, this all boils down to this one thing. But before I get to what that one thing is, let me tell you the story. You ever walked into a movie halfway and you're like, wait, I missed something. So let me just catch you up, okay? Here's the scene that we're getting ready to read into. Jesus is hanging out. He's got his disciples, and Jesus is now surrounded by a bunch of scholars and religious leaders. But see, here's the thing. They had ulterior motives. Their whole goal was to undermine Jesus. They were trying to trip him up. They'd always try to get him into a conversation where he would say something, and they'd be like, oh, technicality, Jesus, and they could point the finger at him. So they were always trying to trip him up. Every conversation was like entrapment. And so here's the thing where Jesus is hanging out with his disciples, the scholars show up, and they start peppering him with a bunch of theological and political questions. That Jesus is on the hot seat. And they're like, hey, Jesus, so, okay, okay, um, some people here have this view on, like, marriage and, and divorce, and like, hey, what Jesus, what say you, and what's it gonna be like in the afterlife? Is there gonna be marriage in heaven? And I mean, I, I mean, these are complicated conversations, and they're trying to get Jesus to pick a team. Because see, back then, there was tribes just like there's tribes today. Back then, there were people who had their view of things, and they were always in animosity, and so they were like, well, Jesus, which camp do you fall into? And Jesus was so wise because he knew what was going on. He didn't play their game. But as Jesus is sitting here in this conversation, they're peppering him with questions. One of the religious leaders actually has a really sincere question. And this is the question I think a lot of us might be asking right now. So if you're here and you're like 80 years of age, this is a good question for you. If you're here and you're like 13, 14, 15, 19, 20, 24, this is the question you are asking. You might not phrase it this way, but this is the question you're asking. So here's where we pick up in the story. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So he's, he overhears the debate of the conversation. Jesus getting asked these questions. And one of the teachers comes up and he hears what's going on. He notices that Jesus had given them good answers. So then he's like, okay, Jesus, you, you, you seem to know what you're talking about. 
I got a question for you. And here's the question. He says, of all the commandments, because there's hundreds of them, like of all of them, which one is the most important? What, what does it come down to? Like Jesus, it seems that things have gotten kind of complicated. Isn't it true that in life things get complicated? I would say this, that sometimes we make things more complicated. In fact, I would tell you that sometimes when it comes to your walk with Jesus, and even if you're here and you're like, I'm not really sure about Jesus, I'm, I was invited by a friend slash bribed by a friend to come to church, um, I, I just, I'm not sure, like wherever you're at on the Jesus spectrum, you can look sometimes and go, man, it seems really complicated. I remember like going to church as a kid, and, and if you're not used to that, you can walk in and be like, man, what do people do around here? Do, am, I, am I standing? Do I, do I sit? Like, what's the aerobics of church today? Do I put money in? If I don't, am I going to get hit by lightning? Is there, like, it's, I know what it's like to go into places where it's not what you're familiar with, and it can feel complicated. And then guess what happens? You go in your walk with Jesus, and we complicate things. We make it complicated. Do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this. And before you know it, we're not serving any Jesus anymore. We're serving a list of things to do. And, and so in this moment, this religious leader's like, okay, okay, in the fog of the complicated stuff, what does it really boil down to? Now, this is why it's so funny. So Mike Barrett, I said this in the first service, Mike Barrett and I do a podcast, the VP podcast, and Mike brought this up about a month or so ago talking about this very idea of like, sometimes we just have to get back to simplicity. Sometimes we have to push aside all the complexity, all the complications, because it gets blurry and confusing, and some days we wake up going, I've done all the things I thought I was supposed to do, and yet I'm missing out. What, what happened? And so he brought up this analogy of ribs. Anybody here, we got a ribs fans? Anybody like to eat ribs? Okay, if, I, if your hand's not up, we need to pray deliverance and freedom over you because in the name of Jesus, you will love ribs, right? And, and if, you know, if you don't know anything about cooking ribs, um, I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to this. I'm trying my best. I'm, it's a fun hobby, the grilling and smoking ribs and all that kind of stuff. And so I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Anybody here watch YouTube videos on cooking stuff? Okay. There's one, it's called Meat Church. There's one. They got, they got the best rub. Anyways, it's complicated. Like you see people on there be like, man, I got trophies and I got a system down, the three, two, one system where you got to put the ribs on for three hours at the right temperature. Then you got to pull them off. It's like halftime. You bring them into the kitchen, spritz it. You got any spritzers? In? Anybody spritzers out here? They're like, we swear by it. spritzer. Okay. They, I, it's my religion. I'm the spritzer, right? It's like that halftime. Like, and then you got to put it in foil. Oh, oh, oh whoa, 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 wait, man. no, I'm not, I'm not a foil person. I don't belong to that camp. I'm the butcher paper people. We do it a different way. I mean, this is the only way to do that, right? And then you got to make sure you put the brown sugar and the butter in the meantime, and then you put it back on for two hours when it's covered. Then you pull it off, and then you put it on for one hour without anything and just lather it. You don't understand the three, two, one, right? It's complicated. And Mike comes over one day, and he's like, try these ribs. And I'm like, man, those are amazing ribs. I go, what did you do with these? Did you do like the three, two, one thing? He's like, no, 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 no. He says, that's just, that's just too complicated. I just used the three, three. I'm like, what's the three, three? He's like, three hours on at 300 degrees. You put them on, you walk away. Three hours later, you come back ready to go. Rock and roll. So him and I are talking on the podcast about that. And we're both like, that's what it's like following Jesus. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, had all the complicated three, two, one, one, two, three, five, seven, whatever. And he's like, you know what? Following Jesus. And so, this, like, you have to understand this. Like, let's declutter some things. Because the danger is this that if we don't declutter what is complicated, we may miss the actual most important thing. You know, Jesus showed up and he said, I've come that you may have life and life to the full. He didn't mean full by full by saying complicated. Now, life is complicated. We know that. It just is. But sometimes we make what we think following Jesus is about more than what he's asking us to make it about. And so sometimes when we look at where Jesus says, I've come that you may have life and life to the full. So let me just ask the question. If Jesus was here today and he said, hey, you want a full life? You want a life of hope? 
You want a life of peace? You want a, a life of abundance? How many of you would say, yeah, sign me up. I, I'd be down with that. That sounds good. But see, in that same verse, John 10, 10, when Jesus said, I've come that you may have life, life to the full, he contrasted that and said, but the enemy of your soul wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And I started thinking about how does the enemy want to destroy where Jesus wants to give life to the full? And as I started thinking about that, I realized that two of the main ways that Satan wants to bring destruction is number one, he wants to do it by disorienting. He wants to disorient things. He wants to make you like, I'm confused. This is overly complicated and I don't understand. And not only does he want to bring distortion, but sometimes he wants to bring distraction. I can get caught up in so many things and be all up in these things that actually busyness doesn't equal abundance. And so what happens is we can get caught up in distraction, being a part of a bunch of things that Jesus is like, I know you're being distracted now into being really busy, but you're missing me. And so I think one of the ways the enemy brings destruction is through distortion and distraction. This is why it's important for us to understand the simplicity of what Jesus is going to say as he answers the question, what is this all about? What does this come down to? And Jesus is like, here, here, here. Let, me just, let me just kind of clear the deck. Let me simplify things. Here's what Jesus says. You want to know what this is all about? Mark chapter 12, verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. He says, here, stop. Everybody say here. here. Do you know there's a difference between hearing and listening? You know, like a lot of times we can have information come through our ears, the anatomy of how vibrations work and how the inner part of the ear works and it gets translated information in the brain, but sometimes things can come in, but it never makes its way into our heart. Does that make sense? And Jesus, when he says, hey, listen here, he's quoting out of the Old Testament something called the Shema. Shema is Hebrew for the word hear. And if you grew up in a Jewish home, they would recite and quote the Shema every day. It was like their whole life centered around the Shema. So Jesus is saying, hey, 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 pay attention. Listen, everybody. I've got something really important to say. I think this is, this is good for us because there's so much white noise and static in our lives that sometimes we need the spirit of God to go, Shema. <laughs> Try that with your kids, parents. Your kids are screaming, Shema! Listen! I need your attention for a second. This is Jesus going, ho, 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 listen. Don't miss it. I'm going to say something. And then Jesus goes on to say, here's what's important. Let me make this one thing. He goes on to say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then he says this. This is what it comes down to. Love the Lord your God. Everybody say love. Love, love the Lord your God. Like, well, that's it? Jesus is like, I'm not done yet, but yeah, it's a good start. All this boils down, the complications, comes down to this one thing. Love God. That's it. That's it. What do I do? That's it. Love God. Love Jesus. Wait, wait, wait. And then, and then he says, well, okay. Well, how do we do that? Jesus goes on to say it this way. He says, well, you do that by loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus is being holistic here in terms of our entire being. Like as a person, the wholeness of who I am. So let, let me just like ask you guys to join, this, join me in, in saying this real quick. So just, just humor me on this. Everybody say, love the Lord. Okay, now finish it out with me. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You got that. Great. Everybody good? Should we just wrap up? Closing song? Let's go home. <laughs> Costco dogs, let's do it. You're probably sitting there going, I, I get it. Like, I sort of, I understand what you mean, but what makes it complicated too is we don't even know what the word love means these days. So, so I read something here that says love God, and everybody's like, well, whose definition of love? Because like, there's a, there's a million different definitions people have of love out there. Would you agree with that? I mean, it's like, love, love what? Love, love this, love that. And we use, I mean, we use love all the time. Man, I love that car. Man, I, man, I love their pizza. I love you. Like we we kind of have diluted the word love. In fact, I, I'll say this. We haven't only diluted the word love, we have idolized the word love. Hang on here for a second. 
We've been called to love God, but I think sometimes we've turned love into our God. What do you mean by that? Well, yeah, because if I do anything I want to do but just slap the word love on it, then it justifies the ends. I can do, hey, well, this is done in the name of love. Well, I do this, this isn't done in the name of love. I'm doing this in the name of love. Yeah, but you know those aren't the things that God is for. It doesn't matter. I'm doing them in the name of love. So what we've done is we've taken love as a hall pass to let us do anything that we want to do as this noble, virtuous justification. But what we've done is we have elevated love more than actually God in whom we're called to love. Does that make sense? And the reason for that, too, is because we live in a culture that says everything against what we just said. Like, 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 like Jesus says, here's what it all boils down to. Love the Lord your God. Culture says, no, 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 no. Love yourself. Culture says, love you. Don't love God. Like, or if you love God, love him with the leftovers of loving you first. Love you. Love yourself. It's all about you, right? I said this a couple of weeks ago. We live in a culture that encourages us to worship at the altar of self. It's all about self-worship. And, and I was, I was kind of thinking about that because let me just read this statement here too. Let me just read this to you. We can obey God without loving him, but you cannot love God without obeying him. So you see, at some point when I say I'm gonna love God, it has to align with the things, the values of God. Does that make sense? And so I can say out of my mouth, oh, I love God, but then the way I live my life isn't about the things that God is for. This is why at one time Jesus even called them out and said, hey, uh, you come near to me with your mouth, but man, your hearts, your, your love for me is way down the road. It's gone. It's not moving in the right direction. And so I, I started thinking about this whole idea of like living in a culture that is screaming at us to not love God, but love ourselves. Now, is loving yourself necessarily wrong? Not necessarily. Like, some of us could do better at maybe giving ourselves more love in the sense of, like, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, don't compare yourself. Like, sure, there's some ways that we can be. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when we put self-love over love of God where we make ourselves the center of the universe. It's all about me, what I want, what I deserve, what I'm entitled to. And then it's like, okay, God, if you can fit in, maybe, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. The, the best way I can illustrate it is like this. How many of you ever, have ever done camping? Like any, anybody out there? Okay, y'all gotta do it. It's fun, okay. I, I brought my camp chair. I love this, this is a camp chair. And what I, what I appreciate about the camp chair is this. It lets me sit down with the wholeness of who I am. In this chair, it's all a mic. Mind, body, soul, spirit, strength, right? And I started thinking about how like in our world, there's two camps. There's the love God camp and then there's the love self camp. In fact, I might even just kind of show you guys a picture of what, what those two camps look like. See, Jesus defined the camp that he was for as called the kingdom. And in the kingdom, Jesus is king. He's the center. He's, he's the, the, the focus of the whole thing, not ourselves. And so Jesus says, when I'm king in your life, like I come with hope, I come with peace, I, I come with purpose, I, I, I come with strength, I, I come with meaning, and I come with power, and, and if you just kind of make me king, like that's how you come into my kingdom, See, here's what I find so fascinating was as we read this story, the guy that looks at Jesus and says, hey, what's the most important thing? Well, Jesus says what we just read, love the Lord your God with our heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. And then I'm going to fast forward for a second because then that guy looks at Jesus and goes, Jesus, you, you're right. Like he, was, like he was saying, Jesus, good job, you got it. And then Jesus looks back at him and goes, oh, because you know I got it, you got it. It's a little weird. But he's basically confessing, this religious leader, like, yes, Jesus, you're right. That's what this all comes down to. It, it all comes down to like Jesus loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Now watch this, don't miss this, don't miss this. Jesus looks at him. After the guy just said, Jesus, you're right, that's what it's all about. Jesus says these words to him. Oh, good of you to be right, good of you to get it. You have come close to the kingdom. Wait a minute. See, last time I checked, there's a difference between close and in. How many of us come close to being in the kingdom but never in the kingdom? 
See, a lot of us, we can, we can do the, the mental or verbal confession. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> my life is all about love, Lord, you got with all my heart, my mind, my strength. Yeah, 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 I got that. But actually, it's possible to say that but never live in it. We can be close to the kingdom but never in it. Because the way that we get in the kingdom is when we say we are truly loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because on the other side, you, you got love of self, which is what culture is saying all the time. And so I, I started thinking about that word close, like, oh my goodness, how many of us spend our whole life living close to kingdom but never in it? And I think the reason for that is because we want to stay in close proximity to both options. And I started thinking the word close and the word fringe came up. So I'm like, oh, what's the definition of fringe? The border of outer edges of an area or a group. And I started thinking about it. Jesus invites us to set up camp where he's the king and it's all about loving God with our heart, with our soul, with our mind and our strength. But culture said, no, 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 don't put your chair in that camp. You gotta put your camp chair over here and it's all about you. Loving you, making life about what you want, your entitlement, everything. And I started thinking like, okay, well, well, none of us as Jesus followers would actually say, if we're honest, well, that's the camp I'm, I'm setting in. So you know what we do? I'll just live in the fringes. If I can just live in the fringe, then I don't have to fully commit to being in because I like what both have to offer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna park right here. I think most believers have a fringe faith. We love to live in the fringe, but here's the thing. A fringe faith is a fragile faith because the minute that I give my heart to Jesus and I don't get what I want out of the deal, I'm fragile and I'm gonna go, well, let's see what the world has to offer today. I, I don't know if I wanna give God my heart because last time I did that, things didn't go out the way I was hoping. So you know what, um, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna live in the fringe here. I'm just going to try to play it here. I don't want to give too much to him because I like what the world offers too. And man, it's, it's super good. And I can, is there just a way that I can kind of have both worlds? The problem is this. Living in fringe faith will never let you live fully in the kingdom. You'll never live in the place of the abundance and the fullness that Jesus has for us. And I think a lot of us work really, really hard to set up our lives in the fringe. And in fact, I was thinking about this. There's a theme song. You know, how many of you know what lyrics are? Okay. I'm just wondering. You've got to ask these days, right? And, and I started thinking about this, and I was like, you know what? If there was a theme song to culture right now, like if culture can put a mashup between some songs, put a beat to it, put some lyrics to it, and I started thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? I got it. So you guys, I wrote a song. I'm not going to sing it to you. So, I'm, sounds like I need to. Sounds like I need to. <laughs> we'd, have to we'd have to do a healing service after that if I, if I did that. <laughs> but I did write the lyrics to what I think is culture's theme song of worshiping ourselves. What's the worship lyrics of culture? It's this. My rights, my money, my car, my gender, my body, my life, my opinions, my choice. My, 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 my. Did I get it? Some of us are like, oh, I played that song last night. But that's, I'm just telling you, that's the hit song for culture right now. Set yourself up over here. It's all about me, right? When Jesus is like, ah, actually, man, come into my camp. Give your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, all of who you are. Give it to me. The world is going to let you down. The world will never, ever fulfill and satisfy. It always overpromises and underdelivers. And Jesus is like, please, come to me. Give me your heart. Give me your sorrows, your pain, the things that worry you, stress you down, the things that confuse, like, just give it to me. Love me, love me. Because the Bible tells us that we can only love him because he first loved us. See, that's the only way we can love him. We don't, we don't have to try to blaze a trail to earn his love. He's like, I already love you. Just, I want you to be found in my love. When we love God, it's, it's, it's like all of a sudden the healing bomb comes over us and we're like, wow, that's what I've been looking, that's what I was created to be. The whole point of life is to love God and to be loved by God. And so when I give him everything and I let him define everything in my life, that's how we love him fully. And that's why I think for many of us here, can I just make a declaration? Can we be a church that doesn't live in the fringes? 
can, can we, can church, can you agree with me that we, Grace Chapel, make it for you personally, I, myself, I am not going to be a person that sets up my life in the fringes. Because the fringes, there's no light. But it's only when we step closer to him, when we give ourselves to him, that's when we get caught up in who he created us to be and everything he has for us. So again, church, can we agree we are not a fringe church? But we move towards the kingdom, and the way we move towards the kingdom is the path of love. Being loved by him and loving him. That's what keeps us centered in the kingdom. Now, now here's what's interesting, because maybe you're sitting here going, um, <clears throat> help me understand what these words mean. I, I get it now, okay, but I, I'm still having a hard time. What is loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength? Well, let's just break them down real quick. What does it mean to love God with all of our heart? The Greek word for heart here is cardia, where we get the word cardiology, for heart. But what's interesting is this, is that the Bible tells us also when you do a study on the heart, that the heart is deceitful and wicked. Do y'all know that? Do you know that like your heart could actually betray you? Did, did you know that? Some of you are like, uh-huh. That was last week. It's so, it's so funny because culture, again, culture says this, chase your heart's desires. Do whatever makes your heart come alive. Find your heart. I've heard people say, but, 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 but it makes my heart come alive. Your heart, your, you want to follow your heart, your heart's going to lead you off a cliff. Don't always trust your heart. Culture says trust your heart. I'm here to tell you trust Jesus. You trust your heart, your, your, your heart will lead you down a path. This is why, let me just, let's read this to you. I wrote this in my, my own journal. Listen to this. A self-centered person will always be a self-sabotaging person. Because you make this about yourself, you align your heart with yourself, your heart will lead you astray. One day you wake up and you're going, what happened? And your heart's going, it was me. I mean, I, I've, sat here, I've sat here as a pastor, counseling couples, going through hardships in marriage, and I've heard one say, they've gotten into an emotional connection with somebody, but it makes my heart come alive. Your heart's going to lead you off that cliff. Don't trust your heart. You, you, you got to trust Jesus with your heart. Now, now, I'll talk about that in a second, too. But here's what I find interesting. When we look at the word heart there, not only is it deceiving, but here's the thing. I would say it this way. You can, you can write, uh, watch this on the screen. A dislocated heart leads to a disoriented life. Do you know it's actually possible to get a dislocated? We talk about dislocated arm, dislocated shoulder. You can have a dislocated heart. It, it's not working the way that it's designed to function. See, see, the Bible talks about when your heart is in the wrong place, that eventually becomes what's called a calloused heart. How many of you know what calluses are on your hand? Your calluses on your hand is like a thickness of skin, and you, you essentially lose the sensitivity. Your, your hand, and sometimes we think that's a good thing because we can, you know, work with our hands more, but when it comes to the heart, it's always a negative thing. And the Bible talks over and over again that if we're not careful, we can end up with a calloused heart. But I'm here to tell you something. Listen, there's a difference between having a calloused heart and a scarred heart. What, what, what you're like, what, that doesn't make sense. What am I talking about? Let me, let me read a passage to you. Listen to this. This is what uh, Paul says, and I, I think this is good for us. In Galatians 6, 17, watch what he says. Paul says, on my own body, everybody say body. On my own body are the scars that prove I belong to Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is, listen, I follow Jesus and just want you to know that following Jesus with your heart, soul, mind, strength, all of that can come with scars. See, I, I know this because I have a physical heart, just like you do, and what some of you know and what a lot of you don't know is that my physical heart has literal scars on it. Some of you were here where several years ago I was on a hunting trip it was out in the mountains running around chasing after some elk. It was awesome. And then all of a sudden, my heart started freaking out. My start, heart started racing, like 160, 70 beats a minute. Has that ever happened to you? It's crazy scary. And I didn't know what was going on at the time. We were like, well, maybe I'm having a heart attack. So I get life flighted. Only time I've ever been on a helicopter. I always want to be on a helicopter. It's not that way. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see anything. I was like, just lots of wires and lights everywhere. And they take me to the hospital and thankfully wasn't having a heart attack. Was what they discovered was that I had an irregular heartbeat. I would go into AFib, is what it's called, a fibrillation. I would go into AFib, my heart would race. I get done with a sermon, I'd be like 140 beats a minute. 
And they were, well, let's try some medicine. So we tried medicine for a little bit, and it, it kind of helped a little bit. And then eventually they said, listen, if we really want to take care of this, you need to have what's called an ablation. An ablation is where they actually go in because your heart beats because of the electrical currents. And so what happens is those electrical currents get out of alignment. They don't work the way they're supposed to, and so your heart starts beating out of rhythm, causes all kinds of crazy stuff to go on. It's not fun at all. So what they have to do, the ablation is they go in and they sear, they burn those electrical currents, they actually scar places on your heart to get it back in rhythm. Does that make sense? So here, here's what I'm trying to tell you. It took my heart physically, it needed some scars to put it back in alignment with the right rhythm. See, there's a difference between having a calloused heart that's jaded and bitter and angry at God. There's another type of heart that sometimes if I give my heart to Jesus, it will come with some scars. I'm just here to tell you, because some of us go, I'm going to give my heart to Jesus and there'll never be any scars. No, I'm here to tell you, you give your heart to Jesus, as Paul said, I have the scars to show it. But here's what I'm also trying to tell you. Sometimes we need our hearts to have a scar because it puts us back into alignment and in rhythm with the heartbeat of Jesus. Sometimes I need that scar so I love people the way Jesus would love on his heart. I see people the way Jesus would see because I have the Father's heart. Does that make sense? Sometimes in the church we need less calloused hearts, more scarred hearts. Does that make sense? Because listen, I'm not, I'm not going to be the preacher that says give your heart to Jesus and it's just always going to be daisies and flowers and all that kind of stuff. And it will. There's life in that. There's life in that. If, if life means that I have the heartbeat of Jesus. And because I think sometimes what happens is we sit here in the fringe because we gave our heart one time to Jesus and it got scarred. I trusted Jesus one time and I didn't get healed. I trusted Jesus with a relationship and it didn't work out. Like, think about this for a moment. When was the last time, don't raise your hand because that would be awkward. I would say, is anybody dating anybody? Because like, or we could do the other thing. If you're not dating anybody, we'll just, we'll just do that. And then, you know, but I'm not going to do that. But I want you to imagine that you're like, how hey, I want to date somebody. And you're like, okay, so you, you, you know, you meet them at school. You meet them at church. You, you, you meet them online. I've done a lot of weddings that come from online. And, you know, there's all kinds of apps out there. You know, there's eHarmony, Christian Harmony, Bumble. I heard there's even like silver singles. I hear that one's like, that's amazing, whatever. And let's, so let's say, okay, you're going into this going, I want to meet somebody. Let me just, just how many of you would do this? If you went on a first date with someone and they said, hey, I, I just want you to know, um, I, I want to date, but I'm not going to give you any of, like I have no intention of giving anything of my life. I, I, I want to date, but I just want it to be all about what I get out of it. How many of you be like, sweet, can we date two ready to go? Or how many of you be like, out? You would. You would, listen, you would. Jesus wants your heart because he's the only one that has given everything to earn it. Jesus comes to the table and says, give me because I'm all in. I'm all, I'm all in. Nobody else is going on. The, world, the world's not going to die for you. Culture's not going to die for you. Culture's not going to lay its life down for you. Jesus is like, I, I want to give you my, I'm giving you, I'm all in for you if you give me your heart. And I, I think for many of us here, you might have to learn to trust again and say, okay, Jesus, that was hard last time, but I want to keep. I don't ever want to hold back from you. And, and then he goes on to say, not only do we love the Lord God with all our heart, he says, love the Lord your God with all your soul. Now, I'm not going to get too deep. There's a lot of theological ways we can go about things called trichotomy, dichotomy. Is the human being made up of the immaterial material? Or is, is, I, we're not going to get into all that. Point of this, let's, let's define the word soul. Now, the word soul comes from the Greek word suke or psyche, which is where we get the word psychology. And it means this. It means who you are, your emotions, your personality, your ambitions, your dreams, your desires, your motives, your hopes, your aspirations. This is like waking up every day going, man, Jesus, I wanna, I wanna love you with everything I think about, like what I dream about, what I wanna do, how I can serve you, how I can follow you. Like Jesus, man, I, I just, I want every part of who I am. The uniquenesses of my personalities, whether I'm an introvert, extrovert, whether I'm a seven on the Enneagram or a 59 on the Enneagram, whatever it is. Jesus, whoever I am, I'm all in for you. I'm all in for you. Like Jesus, I just want to love you with the fullness of all of those things. I dream about you, Jesus. I dream about serving you and following you and, and, and I put my hopes on you. 
And I started thinking about, okay, what's the opposite of that? And like, what's, what's the negative of that? And as I was praying through it, I felt like the Lord gave me a word that doesn't make sense until I started studying it. And I was praying through this passage. I'm like, Lord, what, what is holding us back? Like, what's, what would be the opposite of a healthy soul? And then I heard the word just in my mind, and I, and I wrote it down. And it's the word disgusted. And I was like, what does that mean, Lord? Why, why, why am I hearing dis, a disgusted soul? So I looked up the word disgusted, and, and here's what it means. It means feelings. So again, there's the emotions, the feelings part of our soul. It means feelings or expressing revulsion, outrage, appalled, offended, sickened, or scandalized. And I, I was like, okay, where do we typically see the word disgusted used in context? Let me just, I'll just show it to you. Most of the time when we hear the word disgusting, we think of this. What is this? Is it? Now, now I mean, technically, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it is a garbage can, correct. You can see there's a garbage liner, got some funk on the side of it. It's, it's a garbage can. It, 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 I grabbed it out of the, the lobby, okay? Now, what's interesting, though, is technically, it's not a garbage can. Technically, it's a container. Because isn't it true that I could put my groceries in there? Isn't that true? I mean, isn't it true that if I'm trying to organize my garage, I can put some things in here and store it in here and put it in my garage? Like, technically, could I not do that? Yeah. So what makes this a garbage can is not the fact that it's a container, it's of what? It's what you put in it. What makes this a garbage can is not that it's a container, it's what you put in it. Let me ask you the question, what are you feeding your soul? If my soul is like, man, I'm just the garbage collector, I want, because I, I know this, you see this in culture, I'm going to collect every toxicity. I'm going to collect everything that's offendable. I, I'm going to be offended all the time. I'm going to be toxic. And, and you see this too because like, like you're the person, I say this with all love, that, that like everybody comes to gossip to. And you're like, just bring it all. <laughs> Let me tell you, if you're the person everybody wants to gossip to, it's not a compliment. <laughs> and, and what happens is sometimes in our soul, our soul can get to a place where we have a disgusted soul. Because we're not feeding it on the things of Jesus, we're feeding it on the things of like anger and bitterness and, and rage. And does that mean we can't have things that we believe should be right and have God's sort of righteous anger? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how every time in our life do you live in that space where you constantly are just feeding your soul on negativity or are you feeding your soul on the things of Jesus. He's like, Jesus, I, I, I want to just delight in you. Jesus, I just want to focus on you. And as I worship, it changes my soul. It changes the way I dream. It changes the way I live. Because let me tell you this right now. Whatever you put in is going to affect what comes out. So if I look at my life and the output of my life is living in a place that's opposite of where Jesus is at, I need to go like, man, am I feeding my heart? Am I feeding my soul? on the things of Jesus, what he values, what's important to him. Because out of that would come his life versus the garbage I'm constantly putting in. Now, let me give you a uh, couple more real quick, and then we're going to end. Jesus goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul, and then he says, your mind. Now, this is an interesting one. The word that I, I thought of this is the, the word distorted. How many of you have ever been to, like, you go to, a, like, a fun house, the carnival, the fair, you walk in, they got the crazy mirrors. You know what I'm talking about, the crazy mirrors? Now, the whole point of this is to have some fun. When you go in and you see the distorted mirrors, what's the goal of the distorted mirrors? What's the whole goal? Like, it's fun, it's all cool, we can get that. But what, is it, what does it do to your body? It disfigures your body. See, see, here's the thing. Your mind is a reflection of what you set it on. So when the Bible says to set your mind on Jesus, it means to be obsessed, to be focused on Jesus. So when I say I'm going to love Jesus with my mind, it's, it's this. What percentage of the things that go into my mind are the things of Jesus or the things of the world? 
Think about this all the time. Your mind every single day is gathering information, 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 information. Your mind is constantly processing. Your mind is constantly thinking and thinking and thinking. And so at some point, you have to ask the question, is what my mind obsessed on actually distorting and disfiguring how I see myself? Because listen, if you are feeding your mind on things that are disoriented, things that are not true, it will disfigure your identity. If you feed your mind on culture, if, if, for instance, if you think, hey, success, because culture says you got a lot of money, you got the vacation home, you got the relationship, you got the likes and the friends, and you got all of those things, if that's your definition of success, and you set your mind and goals on that, then what's gonna end up happening is it will disfigure how you see yourself. Then you will wake up one day going, I'm not smart enough, I'm not successful enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not loved, I am not good enough, and you're gonna live a disfigured way of seeing yourself. Not only that, but if you feed your mind on what culture says about who God is, it will disorient your view of God. And if we have a disoriented view of God, it leads to a disfigured faith. And so what we have to do is ask ourselves, man, is what am, I, what am I putting in my mind? Am I, am I dwelling? Am I meditating on the things of Jesus? Am I spending time in his word? Am I, am I just kind of reflecting? Am I pausing? So here's what I want you guys to do. Pull out your cell phones. If you've got a phone, go ahead and pull it out. Go ahead and pull out your phone because I'm going to double dog dare you to do something. Pull out your phone and take a picture of the screen. Because here, hey, this is how I know how, how it happens, right? For most of us, your phone is the gateway to what your brain thinks about the most. Most of us access information through our phone. Most of us do. We we all use laptops, TV, I get that. But most of us, it's our phones. And you're on phone, listen, it's not all bad. Like, listen, I know there's things on there. You grab it and you're like, man, I got got Instagram, Facebook, tickety, tickety talk. I mean, I got got everything on there, all right? (laughs) We got it all. If all you're doing, no, like emails on your phone, text messages on your phone. Here's what I want you to do. This is, I'm going to double dog dare you. Make this your screen page on your phone. I dare you. Some of you are like, but no, like our family picture's on there. Our pet is going to be offended if I take the picture off. Do it for one week. I'm asking you to do this for one week. Why am I doing this? I'm, try, I'm trying to shepherd your mind trying to help you shepherd your own mind. Because every time your phone turns on and there's the temptation to a distortion, you get an email from your boss that's chewing you out and instantly you begin to think, I'm nobody, I'm a failure, I'm this. You get a text from a friend that says something, distortion. You get online and you see that everybody else, come on, you watch something on social media and you feel like I'm comparing my life to what everybody else has and it makes my life feel empty. That's called distortion. And I'm trying to encourage you to try this for one week, that every time that pops up and you see that, that is a reminder of where you're going to choose to set your mind. And maybe for some of us, you got to be like, man, that's, that thing's reminding me a lot. Yeah. And maybe, 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 maybe it won't only just remind you, it'll cause you to pause for a second, for five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds and set your mind back on Jesus. Jesus, you are good. Jesus, you are faithful. Jesus, I I know that I got a lot of stress and anxieties and worries in life, and what if I swapped for every minute that I am bombarded by those messages, I'm gonna take 30 seconds, 20 seconds, and set my mind back on you. I wonder what would happen if there would be a complete restructuring of our minds, and I'm gonna set my gaze back on you. I just wonder what the breakthrough might happen for many of us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your strength. Strength means everything that you have, everything that you bring to the table. And I know right now, as soon as I say that, there's some of us in the room going, wait, wait, Mike, but I don't have strength. I don't, I don't, like, I get the idea of, like, loving God with my strength. Like, oh, man, I have all these skills and abilities and talents. That's what it means But there's some of us in the room going, but I don't have that. Mike, I don't have physical health. I don't have strength. I can't get out of bed. 
I, I can't go downstairs. I, I can't even go to work. Mike, you don't understand. I, I, I struggle with, with other things like anxiety or fear or I have, I have physical things going on. I have, I mean, Mike, I don't have strength. Here's what I want to tell you. You don't have to love God with all your strength. That also means loving him with all your weakness. Jesus, I'm not going to wait till the day when I've got everything figured out where I'm strong and I'm superman and I'm superwoman. The Bible tells us that we experience his power when we are weak. For some of us, the best posture of loving Jesus is going to be out of a place of weakness. I'm struggling with addiction. I'm struggling with fear. I'm struggling with health. I'm struggling with a broken marriage. I'm struggling with a job that is dead-ended. I'm struggling in these relations. I'm struggling in my loneliness. I'm struggling in these things, and I don't feel strong. I'm here to tell you, take where you're weak. That's part of your strength. Whether you gotta take a crawl, whether you gotta take a step, whether you gotta just nudge your way to Jesus, but my point is this, whatever, when, wherever you're at, move in the direction of saying, Jesus, I'm gonna love you. I'm not going to wait till someday, till everything is perfect, but today I'm going to move towards you. You know, it's interesting at the very end of this, Jesus says, love the Lord your God. This is what it all comes down to. Just love God. That's it. Love God. Love him with your mind. Love him with your heart. Love him with your soul. Love him with your strength. And what's interesting is he tags on there and he says, oh, 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 in place everybody forgets, uh, part of the great commandment is to also love your neighbor as yourself. You know, it's interesting because I think that he put the right order in there. Because I don't think we can love our neighbor until we know how do we love God. Because when we love God fully, it aligns our heart to love others the way that we need to. Because there's no way that you can love God fully and hate anybody that's created in his image. And so I love that in this moment here, after we go through that process of aligning our hearts, our mind, our body, and our strength, he invites us into the expression of love to those around us. So here's what we're gonna do. Worship team's gonna come up here. We're gonna wrap up. Will you guys stand with me? I'm gonna invite you to do something. Side page. We start off by talking about those who were in the fringe. Like, like, intellectually, I get that. But what does it mean to move? Now, I, I just want to invite you. Would you just close your eyes? Let's just have a moment of reflection. And this is a great chance. You know, this is something that God's been working on my heart for me, personally. Sometimes I get into the busyness and the hecticness, and I have to do this prayer while I'm driving. I do it a lot while I'm driving, to be honest with you. Before I go into a, a meeting with somebody, before I step into you know, a business meeting, a personal meeting, before I step into something, I try to just take a moment and I just have this honest time with God. And I ask myself the question, Lord, is there anything in my heart, in my mind, my soul, my strength, that I'm not trusting you with, I'm not, I'm not loving you with? Is there anything in my heart, life, mind, soul, all of it that I've been focused more on me and what I get out of the deal? And then I hear that quiet voice of the Holy Spirit in a loving, non-shaming way say, Mike, I think you've made this more about you. I've heard that voice a lot. It's a loving, gentle voice. But I think if we just stop and invite the Holy Spirit to search our heart and soul right now, that we could, in return, can confess those things, say, God, I want to come back to you. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit would just speak to you. and Maybe he's going to highlight. He'll never shame you. Spirit of God never comes with like that judgment, shame. He only comes with an invitation, an invitation to surrender more of ourselves, to risk more of our life, because on the other end is receiving more of his life. So I'm just gonna pray over you and just say, Holy Spirit, right now, would you speak to us? Here we are. We got busy, hectic things to get after after this, but right now, in this moment, may we not settle for living in the fringe 
So if there's anything in our hearts, anything in our minds, our soul, our spirit that you're saying you want to trust us to trust you with, would you just speak that over us right now? I'm just going to let you listen. Let him highlight something. Maybe for some of you, it's that deep soul place of the emotions of feeling hurt, angry, bitter, sad, lonely, afraid. Maybe for some of us, we've been working so hard in our life, building the idols and the trophies of this world. And Jesus says, hey, I want to do so much more with your time and talent and your treasure. I want to do so much more. Would you give that to me today? Just love me more with that. Just love me more with that. Maybe for some of us, if we've lost the ability to dream, we can't even imagine a life with purpose and legacy and significance. And Jesus is like, just, I'm not done with you. Just keep loving me with that. Just give that to me. Love me with that. And at the end of the day, it's going to come down to one posture for all of our hearts, mind, soul, and spirit. And it's a posture of surrender. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you can do it, if you can't, just stay standing. Some of our knees don't always work the way they used to. But I'd invite you right now to actually do a physical posture that might help us posture our hearts. Would you guys just get down on your knees if you can? If you can't, just stand with your palms open. If you're standing, just, just have your palms open. Jesus, we just are here postured physically, but we pray that this would actually be the expression of our hearts, our minds, and our soul and spirit. Jesus, you are Lord. You are King. You are the center. We don't want to settle for fringe. We don't want to settle for living outside or just clothes. We want to be centered fully, abundantly in your love, all that you have for us. And you invite us to love you fully. We want to move out of that place and that posture of self-love where Jesus, you are the focus and the center of our affections and our desires and everything. And Jesus, as we are postured right now, we pray, Spirit of God, would you come? Let this be a moment of life giving. Holy Spirit, would you come down and fill us with the overflow of the life of Christ? May we not just get up from our knees now and sing songs, but may we have the same posture as we take it into every arena of our lives, where we live, where we dream, our marriages, our relationships, in those dark places of our fears and worries and stresses and all of those things, Jesus, we just continue to, to drop to our knees before you. We worship you. We exalt you. We love you. We adore you. May we be so captivated with who you are. We set our gaze upon you. We fix our mind upon you. I pray for renewed minds right now. Holy Spirit, that there be renewed minds right now. Fresh way of thinking. Fresh outlooks on life. Bigger faith. Bigger hope. Healing. Strength. Power. And Jesus, as we surrender to you, we pray this in your awesome, powerful, holy name. Amen. Amen, church. Hey, you, let's just stand together. We're going to sing a closing song of worship. And as we go sing, this is going to be a song about his faithfulness. God is faithful. How many of you believe that we have a faithful God? Can we, let's make a deal. Can we agree to move out of the fringes of our faith? Can, can we not settle for the lies of culture? that we would move in the fullness of the life that Jesus has for us. Can we, can we just agree, no fringe faith here? Can we agree on that? And maybe you're scared, maybe that, that freaks you out, that's not bad. But there is no other way. There is no other way but to be centered where Jesus is king, in the kingdom, we worship him, we adore him. So let's church, can we sing it like we mean it? Can we make this our declaration? And
And can we carry this song as an anthem into our week, work this week? Can we do that? Wherever we go this week, let's carry this song as our anthem. All right, let's worship.